to this weekly English news bulletin on Ronahi TV. After 353 days of battle between people defense units and Al-Qaeda linked groups in Sarikani region, Yepage Fatah succeeded to take over the region from Al-Qaeda affiliated groups. After liberating the strategic city of Tulkuchur on the Rojava Iraqi border, People Defense Units continued their operations, combing the Kurdish areas from the Islamic State of Al Iraq and the Sham, the Al Nusra Front, and other rebel groups. On the 1st of November, Yepage fighters started the first phase of their operation, codenamed Allegiance to the Martyrs of Sarikaniye, in which they liberated 90 villages in three days. In addition, a road connecting Serikani and Tiltamir was secured by YPG forces. Mishrafa village was one of the 19 liberated villages where the Al-Qaeda link groups were positioned and from where attacks were launched on Rojava. The People Defense Unit's control on the Mishrafa village enabled YPG to take control of the road between Serikani and Tiltamir. Afterwards, on 4th of November, YPG started the second phase of their operation. The operation was succeeded in one day, capturing the villages of Tilhalaf, Manajir, and Sarikani Hasake Road. The first two phases of the revolutionary operations YPG launched against Al Qaeda groups on 1st of November have ended on 5th of November with the liberation of 38 villages. After completely liberating Sarikani region from Al Qaeda affiliated groups, the third phase of Yepage's operation started on 6th of November in Tiltamar region by liberating Rabash village and the Assyrian village of Tel Shamiran, located 5 kilometers from Tiltamar city. According to People Defense Units, the Al Qaeda link groups involved in Sarikani region battles withdrew from the region to Raqqa and Tel Abyad cities. In this regard, Redul Khalil, the official spokesman of YPG, stated to Reuters, We started these operations because the Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups were a direct threat to the Kurdish regions. There were daily attacks from their side. YPG fighters would press on to Tel Abyad. As long as they are there, they are still threatening our areas. We will retake all the territory between Tel Abyad and Kobani. After the liberation of the historical village of Tel Halaf and other villages and towns in Serikani region, thousands of people across Rojava, including citizens of Tel Halaf, took to the streets and celebrated Yepage and Yepage victories. <laughs> Tel Halaf village of Serikani region is an archaeological site of Rojava. First findings of the Neolithic culture were discovered in Tel Halaf and subsequently dubbed the Halaf culture. The site dates to the 6th millennium before Christ and was later the location of the Armenian city-state of Rosanna or Rosan. One year ago, some battalions of the Free Syrian Army and Al-Qaeda-linked groups entered the Tel Halaf village. The village served as a stronghold for armed groups to attack the people of Rojava. The existence of these armed groups in Tel Halaf village prompted the Syrian regime to bombard the village several times. The archaeological site of Tel Halaf was damaged by the Syrian regime bombardments and looted by the armed groups. The historical importance of Tel Halaf village was the reasons of widely celebrations in various parts of Rojava. The stars of these celebrations was in Tel Halaf village. The people of Tel Halaf celebrated their liberation from Al-Qaeda link groups. The Yepage and Yepage fighters were welcomed by the people of Tel Halaf by slogans which revived their resistance. In Sarikani city, which is two kilometers away from Tel Halaf village, hundreds of citizens celebrated on 5th of November the Yepage and Tepeje victory in liberating the historical archaeological Tel Halaf village, which was one of the most important strongholds of the Al-Qaeda linked groups. The citizens of Tamshlo also celebrated the liberation of Tel Halaf village. Likewise, the people of Amudis celebrated Yepage's and Yepage's victory in Tel Halaf and Sarikani region. <laughs> Hundreds of
numbers of people in the town of Terbespie and its surrounding villages celebrated also the victory of Kepege in Serikani, Tulkocher and Chalaga. <laughs> The People Defense Units, commonly known as YPG, includes Women Defense Units, which is commonly known as YPG, are the official armed wings of the Supreme Kurdish Council. Since their establishment, the People Defense Units have taken a defensive position, fighting against any group that has the intention of bringing the Syrian civil war to Rojava. People Defense Units were founded after the 2004 Kamishlo uprising, but became active since the start of the Syrian Rojava revolution on March 2011. As of the signing of the Erbil Agreement by Kurdish National Council and People's Council of West Kurdistan, the armed wing came under the command of the Kurdish Supreme Council. People Defense Units, which includes Women Defense Units, have taken a defensive position fighting against any group that has the intention of bringing the Syrian civil war to Rojava. After accession of large number of the females to YPG ranks, Women Defense Units were established on 22nd of February 2013. Although most of the Kurdish militia is made up of women and men of Kurdish origin, it is not infrequent to find fighters of different ethnicities and religions among their ranks. YPG attracted Arabs defecting from the mainstream opposition after their failure to topple the Syrian regime and provide an alternative to Assad's regime. There is also a significant number of Christian fighters within the YPG ranks. After Christians in Rojava witnessed the huge resistance of YPG and YPG fighters against the radical Islamist rebels and their protection to all components of Rojava, Christian youth started to take part in the ranks of YPG and YPG. In late July 2012, after People Defense Units pushed out government security forces from the city of Kobane and took over Hamoudi and Afrin, the Islamic radical groups affiliated to Al-Qaeda started to attack Rojava and its people. The conflict has grown between YPG and Al-Qaeda-linked groups after they expelled a group of jihadists from the Syrian border town of Sarikaniye. The clashes between YPG and Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups has given YPG major support from the people of Rojava. By this support, YPG has legitimized its position as an armed force to protect all the people of Rojava. The support for people defense units and women defense units are increasing. In Afrin city, the Arab Kurdish Brotherhood Council, the City Council and the Star Union prepared launches for YPG and YPG fighters who are fighting Islamist groups in front lines in the region of Afrin. On the other hand, dozens of Arabs and Kurds in Basuta village of Afrin region gathered at a YPG checkpoint bearing their arms and showed their readiness to head to battlefields to support YPG fighters. نحن هي واقفين هون باسم اهالي الباسوطة كراد وعرب واميرات الباسوطة واقفين هون حماية لا ضيعتنا ولا بلدنا بلد بلد واحد ضد كل شيء تكفيري ضد كل شيء ضد البلد واقفين هون لحماية شعبنا واهلنا باراضينا وكلنا يتنا شعب واحد مع اليفكة لاني عم يدافعوا عنا واحنا جاهزين بندافع also in Afri region, a committee of the People Council of Jendela's town visited on 3rd of November injured YPG fighters at Afrin Hospital. The Kurdish community in Saudi Arabia also showed their support to YPG and YPG fighters and sent an amount of 80,000 riyals. According to the Kurdish community, the support for YPG and YPG will continue. On 6 of November, PYD co-chair Salah Muslim met with the Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Bogdanov, who confirmed to PYD's co-chair that Kirsten Geneva II conference will be represented by the Supreme Kurdish Council. Russia's presidential Middle East envoy Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Bogdanov met with some Syrian opposition figures, including the Democratic Union Party's co-chair Salah Muslim, on 6 of November as preparations for the Geneva II conference. The Russian Foreign Ministry stated about the meeting that the main focus in the comprehensive exchange of opinions over the situation in Syria was on preparations for the International Conference Geneva II, according to the Russian U.S. initiative.
The side stressed the urgent need for prompt political settlement of the crisis by means of a Syria-wide dialogue without any preconditions and with the participation of proxies of the Syrian government and main oppositional political, ethnic and religious groups. On his part, PYD's co-chair Salah Muslim stated about the meeting to the Arabic Al-Hayat newspaper that the Geneva 2 conference will not be held before 2014. Muslim added, The Russian officials confirmed to us that Kurds will be presented at Geneva conference through the Supreme Kurdish Council. The co-chair of Peace and Democracy Party, BDP, Salah Haddin Demirtash, warned that the upcoming Geneva 2 meeting will turn to another Lausanne if the Kurds do not participate in the conference independently. In the meantime, he stated that the U.S. officials must meet directly with the PYD co-chair, Salah Muslim. The co-chair of Peace and Democracy Party, BDP, Salah Haddin Demirtash, stated to Radical Daily in Washington that the Syrian opposition is not ready to recognize the Kurdish existence and rights in Rojava. Therefore, it is necessary to the Kurds to go to Geneva II conference independently from the Syrian opposition to avoid turning the Geneva conference into a new Lausanne. In the Lausanne Treaty signed in 1923, Turkey was recognized as an independent nation. Under the treaty's terms, Turkey was no longer obligated to grant Kurdish autonomy. In addition, the treaty divided the Kurdish region among Turkey, Iraq, Iran and Syria. BDP's co-chair Salah Haddin Demirtash also commented on the Democratic Union Party's relations with the United States by saying It is of importance to the U.S. to know the PYD's vision on the events in Syria from them directly. In this regard, Emperor Zaman, Turkey correspondent for The Economist, has given some reasons why the United States should change policies towards serious curves. According to Zaman, in any post-war scenario, one need people or groups with influence on the ground to deliver on future political arrangements. The PYD are not now and have never been a threat to the United States. In a post-war scenario, the West is going to be looking for influential voices on the secular side to balance what will likely be a large percentage of religious-based organizations. The PYD could be one such ally, along with other minorities, notably Christians. Not talking to the PYD only drives it closer to Moscow and Tehran. To discuss U.S. and PYD's relations, we are now joined live from Washington, D.C. by Mr. Motlu Chivroglu, a journalist and analyst on Kurdish affairs. Welcome, Mr. Chivroglu, uh, to our show. Uh, first of all, how would you describe um, the United States and PYD's relations uh, since the start of the Syrian Rojava revolution? Uh, first of all, uh, hi to you and to your all, uh, audience from Washington. Uh, as far as the relationship between the U.S. and the PYD is concerned, uh, it's really, in fact, there is no uh, direct relation, visible relations. So the relations are very limited, uh, maybe a true doors to some extent, but openly, diplomatically, the relations are uh, none. So uh, uh, listen, I can start with that. What are the factors that played a role in having such relations, in your opinion? Uh, there are, I think, uh, several reasons, uh, like you also mentioned in your uh, bulletin, uh, your report. The, the recent uh, Kurdish conference in Washington, this issue was uh, debated in detail. So uh, one of the reasons is that uh, uh, American uh, policies is uh, influenced through uh, Turkey, through Ankara. That's, I think, uh, that's uh, one of the uh, major uh, factors. Also, there is the, the Erbil factor that recently is being uh, uh, vocally mentioned. So these two factors uh, can be a reason. Also, the, the other regional countries, for example, the uh, U.S. is very much focused on the opposition groups. Mm -hmm. Opposition groups are uh, supported by uh, Saudi Arabia, besides Turkey, Saudi Arabia and some other countries. And uh, the, the same opposition, they are very reluctant to, to accept Kurdish rights, to talk with Kurds, 
I think this is another uh, reason why the uh, U.S. is uh, not keen on uh, mm -hmm. talking to BYD. So in this regard, um, at the first Kurdish conference in U.S. Uh, organized by BTP on the 28th of October, the former U.S. ambassador to Turkey, James Jeffrey, hinted that uh, Washington would be unwilling to meet with uh, Salah Muslim while uh, the governments in Hawler and Ankara continue to object. Uh, could that mean that there is a U.S. willingness to meet BYD co-chair uh, Mr. Yes, you are right. Mr. Uh, James Jeffrey is a very uh, experienced uh, veteran diplomat. He used to be the uh, ambassador in Turkey and Iraq, so he knows the Kurdish issue very well. He's, before that, he was to be a counselor in, uh, in Turkey too, so he knows the Kurdish issue very well. Mm -hmm. What he hinted what, what is uh, very important. That's why uh, many people think this is what the official position, U.S. government position is that. But, uh, like he also said, uh, the VSS. Uh, can, doesn't have any luxury to ignore a power, uh, a power like Dubai that has proven itself to be a real power in Syria, in general, overall Syria, militarily, grassroots support, public support, and mm -hmm. uh, politically. So mm -hmm. Dubai, everyone in Washington agrees that Dubai is a power in Syria, and it's, uh, it is uh, not in the U.S.'s uh, interest to deny or to ignore Dubai. So it's, uh, when you look at this perspective, American uh, foreign policy I and mean, American interest, that's not very really unlikely that uh, the Washington is uh, going to uh, meet and talk with PYD. So that's possible, very possible in the near future that uh, Mr. Muslim or any other high-level uh, PYD officials will be invited to, to Washington, D.C., and uh, will be, uh, you know, talk. Take Going up, back uh, here to Hawler, why would Hawler object such uh, a step? I think recently, uh, in both Kurdish and international media, this is uh, debated vocally. I think it's, uh, first of all, uh, Hawler has a very strong relationship with uh, Ankara. So, mm -hmm. but ec economical ties uh, probably is a, is a factor why Hawler uh, is doing this. So, uh, rather than upsetting Turkey, uh, just uh, to, to create a policy that would match Ankara's. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ankara's law, like uh, just uh, two days ago, CNN International in the uh, report, it's uh, you know, disclosing how these uh, jihadist uh, militants are easily traveling to Turkey, coming all the way to Hatay uh, by uh, air, and then easily transported to the other side. So P I spoke to PYD and YPG officials many times, mm -hmm. and I wrote it in several uh, you know, media outlets, both in, in, in Kurdish and in uh, English, they always uh, claim that this is happening, but it was hard for international uh, media to really realize until the recent CNN report. That report clearly uh, shows. So Ankara has a role from the very beginning, a very uh, uh, negative attitude to towards Kurds. Mm -hmm. and this might be a dominant factor for Hewlett. On the other hand, there's also a, there's also a political uh, struggle going on between KDP Mm -hmm. and the PYD. I'm mm -hmm. saying KDP because PUK openly denounced that what is happening is the KRG's uh, policy. If that's the case, then this is uh, you know, KDP's policy. So uh, uh, KDP is, uh, has own vision for Rojava. Mm -hmm. To what Syria. extent uh, can PYD be blamed of this kind of relations uh, with U.S.? Uh, I couldn't get the question a bit, please. To what extent can uh, PYD be blamed of this kind of relations with U.S. in your opinion? Uh, rather than blamed, uh, what, uh, well, as a journalist, as an analyst, uh, I, I know, I know uh, Turkish, I know Kurdish, so mm -hmm. I can re and I know to some extent, I have some Arabic resources, I can reach myself to the PYD's uh, uh, resources. But not many people are in this situation. The, the, the language of the international media, international politics is English. And I, I think PYD is very weak to address uh, mm -hmm. Washington, to reach Washington and other important uh, you know, capitals. So P, uh, if PYD has a more stronger, let's say, foreign relations office or a more uh, media office, that could uh, tell, uh, that will be very effective. Mr. Demirtas, uh, you just mentioned in your report, I, I interviewed Mr. Demirtas. And Mr. Demirtas clearly indicated that uh, many people, uh, we have seen that in Washington circles, PYD has been misunderstood. There is a misconception about it. If this is the case, then it shows that it's, it also depends on you to correctly express yourself to Washington, to policymakers, to think tanks, to journalists, to who you really are, what you really think. 
I think this might be one of the issues that mm -hmm. PYD might address. Also, PYD's relationship with the opposition or in regards to the, the, the Assad regime, PYD uh, may be more clearly defined where it stands. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this issue, the, the, the PYD issue, and Mr. Muslim was the, 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 the point of attention in the conference. I noticed that. So there is a, there is a strong attention for PYD. Every mm -hmm. uh, conference I go to cover or I go to talk, I always see that people are wondering a lot what mm -hmm. PYD says, what PYD uh, thinks. So there is a there is a strong attention for PYD. Everybody is curious about PYD. So, Motri Chivrolu, journalist and analyst on Kurdish affairs, you've been with us with uh, from uh, Washington D.C. Thank you very much for speaking to Rona Hay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thousands of Kurds in Rojava and northern Kurdistan protested on 7 of November. The wall Turkey is building between these two parts of Kurdistan. The protests organized by Peace and Democracy Party were attacked by Turkish police. Thousands of Kurds in Rojava and northern Kurdistan protested on Thursday against the wall Turkey is building between Rojava and northern Kurdistan border calling it a move to stop Kurdish communities, strengthening ties as Syrian splinters from civil war. Riot police attacked the protests organized by Peace and Democracy Party BDP and fired tear gas to disperse groups of demonstrators as the sit-down protests began following the main speeches. The rally saluted Aisha Kokan, the mayor of Nusaybin, who just broke off a nine-day hunger strike to protest the war construction between Rojava and northern Kurdistan. Aisha Kokan, who also attended the rally, told the crowd, We have not accepted nor we will accept the crime against humanity, this black scar that people want to commit here. As free and democratic women, as the Kurdish people, we will continue to fight against this oppression and this shame. On his part, BDP's leader Salah Adin Demirtas told the crowds that the government had promised to abandon the plans, but said the protests should continue until the border was fully open to trade. He accused Turkey of backing radical Islamists fighting against Kurdish people in Rojava. The execution wave of Kurdish political activists in East Kurdistan is continuing. On the 4th of November, the Iranian authorities executed the Kurdish political prisoner, Shergo Morafi, who was jailed in Sakas prison. The 34 years old Murafi from Bani, city of eastern Kurdistan, was arrested and sentenced to death on charges of enmity against God on 1st of November 2007. His death sentence was confirmed twice on 14th of November 2009 and 1st of May 2011, but he wasn't executed due to the public pressure. On 4th of November, the Iranian authorities executed the Kurdish political prisoner, Shergo Murafi. On the other hand, it is alleged that another political prisoner, Mutlab Ahmadi, has also been taken to the execution cell in Sikas prison. While Amnesty International warned in a statement that two other death row prisoners from eastern Kurdistan, Zaniar Muradi and Luqman Muradi, are at imminent risk of being executed. Mansour Arwand, the Kurdish political activist, is also at imminent risk of being executed. Iranian High Court has recently approved the death sentence of Arwand, who is currently being held in Urmia jail in East Kurdistan. Mansour's brother Sherwan Arwand started a YouTube campaign to stop Mansour's execution. The recent wave of executions in eastern Kurdistan has sparked protests in Kurdistan. On November the 5th, residents of the Kurdish city of Mariwan staged a spontaneous demonstration. According to witnesses, special guard forces have attacked the demonstrators and arrested some of them. On the other hand, Kurdish students at Tayama Nur University in Mariwan city of East Kurdistan handed out leaflets and posters to protest the wave of executions in eastern Kurdistan, demanding an immediate halt to the executions of the Kurdish political prisoners. 
Tartar Kurdistan, an association of German activists, have organized a demonstration in the, in the German capital Berlin on 16 of November to demand the removal of the ban the German state has imposed on the Kurdistan Workers' Party PKK for 20 years now. During the demonstration, which will be joined by Kurds living in Germany, as well as German non-governmental organizations and individuals, demonstrators will call on the German government to support the democratic resolution process in northern Kurdistan and to end its policies against Kurds. On 26 of November 1993, German Interior Minister Manfred Kanter of the Helmut Kohl government announced a ban of the PKK with a special bulletin prepared by the Federal Prosecution Office. Dozens of Kurdish associations and establishments were closed and a systematic policy against Kurds was put into effect after the introduction of the ban on the party. The demonstration to mark the 20th anniversary of the PKK ban in Germany will start with a march from the Alexandria Platz and be followed by a rally near the Parliament of the Federal Republic of Germany. The 8th London Kurdish Film Festival is taking place between 15th and 24th of November with the biggest and richest selection of films and events today. In this year's program, 121 films will be exposed from four parts of Kurdistan, including two essential documentaries which cover the Rojava revolution. According to the organizers, the 8th London Kurdish Film Festival will be the biggest and richest selection of films and events to date. In this year's program, 121 films will be exposed, comprising 23 features, 46 documentaries, and 52 short films. The festival brings together the largest selection of films from four parts of Kurdistan and the world. Aiming to play a vital role in unifying the divided Kurdish nation, protecting and developing their culture, as well as introducing them to the wider world. As with a record number of feature films, a record number of documentaries will be showcasted, which cover a wide range of issues concerning Kurds and Kurdistan, including two essential documentaries from Rojava. The Silent Revolution, which takes an in-depth look at the struggle of the Kurds in creating a new and free life in a war-torn area. cigarette which follows the family as they try to escape the war and survive in a refugee camp in South Kurdistan. The short film Barbet Wire will also be shown in the 8th London Kurdish Film Festival. Barbet Wire is about relatives and loved ones who are separated by the barbet wires that separate Rojava and North Kurdistan. The Syrian civil war drags on, more and more foreign fighters are coming to the country to join the Syrian civil war. In this regard, CNN's correspondent Nick Patton Walsh reported on a road in Turkey where jihadists are being smuggled into Syria. The report shows clearly how jihadists are using Turkey as a launching point. Just miles from Syria's savage war is Turkey's Hatay airport. International in all the wrong ways. Every flight we secretly film land carried men from countries Al-Qaeda calls home. Why are they here? Two from Mauritania, these four from Libya with large backpacks. Hello, how are you doing? Where are you from? Benghazi. Benghazi, okay, okay. 
another from Egypt, then Saudi Arabia, even Leicester in the UK. Most must be innocently travelling, but many say little and rush into waiting cars. It's astonishing to see such a global crowd, so open and close to Syria, where Al-Qaeda is blooming, right under the noses of Turkish border control. Many arrivals are bound for this, the border into Syria. The smuggler drives us along his route from the airport through safe houses around Hatay towards the fence. Where he delivers foreign jihadis straight to the Al-Qaeda-linked merchants sweeping to power in Syria's anarchic north. When they get to the fence, he says, they kneel and cry, they weep, like they just met something more precious to them than their own family. They believe this land, Syria, is where God's judgment will come to pass. What's extraordinary is the sheer pace. What started as a trickle of foreign recruits going to fight the Syrian regime has turned into a flood, we're told, trebling in pace since the chemical attacks around Damascus in August. This smuggler, in the last few months, shipping across 400 people. This Iraqi jihadi was shaking with excitement about his one-way trip the next morning. I'm so happy to be going to Syria, he says. Hopefully, I will die fighting. There are as many Europeans coming as Arabs now. We want an Islamic caliphate from Syria to Anbar in Iraq, without borders, but with Islamic law. Our fight is with the West now, too, as their silence means they're complicit. This is so serious for Turkey that you can now see Al-Qaeda from the Turkish border. The black flag of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria showing they run the Syrian town of Jarablus. Turkey insists it is fighting extremism, but this frantic traffic of jihadis risks making Al-Qaeda the new rulers of Syria's north and putting their latest and boldest sanctuary right on NATO's most volatile border. Let's move on to the press review and a selection of what has been written about Kurdistan and Syria. Murat Yetkin has written an article in Horiyet Daily News about how the Syrian crisis affects Turkish Kurdish dialogue and said, The civil war in Syria has been negatively affecting Turkish Kurdish dialogue. The Democratic Union Party PYD of Syria claims that the Al Qaeda affiliated groups in Syria have been receiving support from within Turkey. However, the alleged links of radical Islamist groups within the country as to the existing problems regarding the continuation of the dialogue between the government and PKK. It is also a problem between Turkey and its main ally, the United States. Carol Droth wrote in her address about the war in Syria and Rojava by saying, In Syria, Kurds fight a war within a war. Both Kurdish militias and radical Islamist groups have captured territory from the Syrian regime, but their respective political goals are not the same. The Interpress News Agency published an article about Rojava women and entitled it with For Kurdish women, it is a double revolution. The PYD's co-chair Asya Abdullah stated in this regard to IPS that the women in Rojava are taking part in all organizations, social, political and military. After suffering Damascus boot for decades, ours is a national struggle, but women liberation comes at the same time. We will not make the mistake of waiting until the war is over to achieve our rights. That is why we say for Kurdish women, it is a double revolution. Fahim Tashtakin has also written for Al Monitor about the wall Turkey is building between northern Kurdistan and Rojava and entitled the article with The Wall of Shame and said, the mayor of Musebin, Aisha Kokan, is a woman on a hunger strike against the war. The government that interferes with everything doesn't say a word. That's all for this week. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.